I think a crucial principle across all of these little groups and initiatives is that it's not about the program. It's not about thinking, oh, here's a great idea that we can roll out and do everywhere. It's not, um, you know, it's not that we've got a food bank. It's not that we've got a kids discipleship group. Actually, it's, it's about each and every person. It's about recognizing that each and every person is on a discipleship journey. And it's our job to accompany them and to treat them, each one, is infinitely precious. So here in North America, we're seeing trends of religious disaffiliation that are actually already far more advanced in Europe. In spite of these changes and challenges, the Spirit of God is raising up, calling, and sending leaders, particularly lay leaders, to cultivate new forms of Christian community that meet people where they are in daily life. In today's Pivot episode, we're gonna cross the pond to the UK to learn from hopeful seeds of new life that are emerging within a context where there is a long Christendom legacy, but only 8% of the current population is actively engaged with the church of any kind. You are in the right place today to hear hope-filled stories of emerging communities of faith, reaching people in neighborhoods, and helping people discover the difference that Jesus makes. Hello, everyone. I'm Alicia Granholm. And I'm Dwight Shiley. Welcome to the Pivot Podcast. If you're new here, this is the podcast where we talk about how the church can faithfully navigate a changing world. In today's episode, we're excited to welcome as our guest, the Venerable Sally Gaze, who serves as Archdeacon of Rural Mission in the Diocese of St. Edmundsbury in Ipswich in the Church of England. Sal is the author of the book, Mission Shaped in Rural, and has been at the heart of some of the most creative innovation that has happened in the UK over the past two decades. Welcome, Sally. Hi, it's great to be with you. So Sally, I had the privilege of visiting you in your context earlier this year. And I got to meet firsthand a bunch of amazing leaders that you're mentoring and to hear their stories about creative new communities that are listening and loving people in the name of Jesus, often outside of the traditional boxes of Inherited Church. Mm. So I knew our listeners would be inspired by hearing some of these stories as much as I was. I wonder if you could begin by describing the region you serve. What is the Diocese of St. Edmundsbury in Ipswich? That's a (laughs) fancy title. Where is it and what are some realities there? Okay, so if you think about the map of the UK, there's a little bit on the east that looks like a pregnancy bump, and that's us. East Anglia is the pregnancy bump, and and Suffolk is the bottom half of that. And it's a it's a rural area, although um, by US standards, it's quite heavily populated because you know we we're not so sparse. You know we haven't got as much land. Basically, we're all crammed in everywhere in the UK. So rural means that. Um, quite a lot of our population is in um, settlements of less than 10,000, some some just like 100 or even less. Um, but the, those settlements are quite, by your standards, quite close to each other. Um, so uh, it, it's uh, Suffolk is Suffolk is the area that we're talking about. And it is by UK standards, uh, quite rural. We've got one sort of bigger town in Ipswich and everywhere else is rural or semi-rural really. Sally, I'd love to hear how you got started with fresh expressions of church yourself. Well, that that's probably going back a long way, actually. <laughs> when I was um when I was 18, I went to work for the London City Mission as a voluntary evangelist. And um, I just met loads of people for whom church didn't really quite fit where they were. And um, we we had this little system as voluntary evangelists and there, there would there was the like the prayer that you wanted people to pray to become a Christian. <laughs> and I just realized it wasn't really quite making sense for people. You know, they'd prayed the prayer, but they didn't really know what they were praying. And um and so when I started studying theology after that, I was 
I was really interested in um, what, what me- you know, what is at the heart of the Christian faith and what, what makes church, church, authentically church? Because it, it seemed to me that we'd got all these sort of ideas of what it needed to be in terms of how it was led and the building and, and, and all that kind of stuff that didn't seem like perhaps what the church was like in the first few centuries. And um, then when I was 21, I sort of went forward for, um, you know, to be assessed to see if I was, could be ordained. And they decided that I, I wouldn't be. I got a no. And uh, I went on a retreat to sort of recover. And I came across this amazing book called Earthing the Gospel by a Roman Catholic theologian. And it was all about this. It was all about um, how do you express Christian life in the culture and context of of the people that you're actually with? And uh, I, I was absolutely captivated by it and um, ended up writing an MPhil on the subject as well. Um, sort of as I was preparing, I did go back and eventually got ordained. So, um, you know, so, so that I carried that heart into ministry with me, really. Um, the Fresh Expressions Movement came along a little bit after that. And uh, because of the research that I'd done in the area, I ended up being on the um, group that looked for it was right in the Mission Shaped Church report, which from which the term Fresh Expressions came. And um, and of course, at the same time, I was experimenting for the first time myself and finding out what God was doing in the little rural area where I was living. Sally, I love that. Um, so I want to touch a little bit on evangelism in the UK because, you know, the Church of England is still the state church, but only has around 1% of the English population in church yeah. each week. So, you know, you mentioned a little bit about how, um, you know, you needed to try some different things with how to help people make sense of the gospel. So I'd love if you could share a little bit more about, you know, what does evangelism look like in the UK today? Oh, um, well, so one of my, one of the uh, people who work with me, they've got this lovely little phrase and they say, um, hospitality is the new evangelism. And I do think that that is a big bit of it, um, but not just hospitality in us. I think as a church, we've often thought that we need to provide for people and that's what hospitality looks like. But actually hospitality often means that we're the guest as well. And so, you know, you think of Jesus talking to the woman at the well and he was the guest but it was all it's all about hospitality but it was about actually coming from the underside and and accepting what other people want to bring as well i i think we've really that's really been reinforced through our experience of covid um in the particularly in the little rural villages um church could be really important in helping people out during COVID, you know, just getting groceries and medicine and so on. But it was it wasn't the church doing stuff for people. It was doing stuff with people. And the good news of Jesus comes through those relationships of love that are built up by working together. And um in our culture, it's not that truth is not important, but the propositional truth of the gospel isn't the first thing that people are looking for to find out what they first want to know is does it work in your life is it making a difference can i see it will it work for me and those those are those are the first questions and then is it propositionally true that you know jesus lived and died on the cross and and you know that those are like secondary questions they come along a bit later so, Sally, it'd be great to hear a little bit more about some of the mixed ecology or, you know, the fresh expressions and alongside and in in and around traditional forms of church in your context. Um, what does that landscape look like? And uh, maybe tell some specifics. Give us some examples, some stories. That is quite hard to talk about it because it is so incredibly varied. Um, but I will start talking about where our sort of heartbeat came from and um we we really felt that um 
that that we were called to be on mission together with other people and uh, so at the heart of lightwave which is the movement which uh that i'm involved with these small missional groups where people are seeing themselves as on mission with jesus and with each other and learning on the way um and they work to discern what god is saying in their place um and we've just had this enormous variety of things come out of that very simple basic thing so um our largest initiative um is in a community called uh, red lodge and it really started um with one person who came on a course about how to lead a missional small group and who was already involved as as a um evangelist in the community um and she realised that there was an opportunity for more. There, were new, there was new housing going up in the community and there was a lot of social need. And um, she she just had a vision for, for more. Um, and we gave her a job um, to, to basically plant a resourcing church for this new community and to work alongside the local, um, well, it was a, it's an ecumenical church where she was. So it wasn't a conventional parish church. It was a, Methodist Anglican Church working together in the area, but much smaller than was needed by the growing population. And um, basically she prayed. That's how it all started. She prayed and um, and she prayed for God to lead her to the people to work with her because she didn't have a group to start with, although she had lots of contacts. She was so keen not to take people away from their current church. We we didn't want we didn't want to take any of that for granted. Um, and things just began to happen. So for example, she turned up at a vicar's house to talk about their village and and how Lightwave might help them and, and so on. And then at this time she was just basically on her own anyway <laughs> but you know she was just looking for ways in to to be able to share the gospel and uh, the vicar um gave her the parish magazine and said oh you know you might find this helpful to get to know the area and then just as she was leaving she said oh no don't take that one because that's the most recent one take this old one because I don't need that anymore <laughs> so she opened up this old parish magazine and there in it was um, somebody who'd written a little thing saying, does anybody feel that they'd like to do church in small groups in, in their home? Because that's what I feel called to. And I've just moved to this village. And um, that was, you know, that fitted exactly what Diane was looking for. So she gave her a ring and that became her first sort of partner in crime. So you just really felt that God was beginning to, uh, gather his people um, and they have just um, a attracted people by their by their love really um, over over covid lockdown in this country happened quite suddenly and um, a lot of people were worried about being able to get the medication about being able to get food um, and this brand new little group um, decided that it would really serve its community. And if anybody rang them up, um, they would, they would, you know, respond within the hour and get back to them. And, and, um, and because of that, the whole community started gathering around and wanted to join in, join in with this volunteer force as it were. <laughs> And uh, the the first person who came to faith, um, she she talked afterwards about how she'd always been involved with volunteering, but now she'd sort of discovered um, the love of Jesus that was at the heart of it all. And uh, she she explained how people had seen them as angels when they arrived on the door with their medication or just to listen or whatever, and. Um, and how that had just really touched her heart. And she came to faith first, and then her daughter came to faith as well. And it began to to spread that way. And they're still 
a reasonably small congregation, um, but they reach out now after COVID. I mean, they're seeing um, a couple of hundred children every week in their children's ministry. And um, they're, you know, they, they've, it's really diversified, you know, so that they're obviously no longer delivering medicines, but people um, come to their uh, cafe to help with social isolation. People um, get get involved with um, um, all, all sorts of things. They've got a Christians Against Poverty Debt Club. Um, there's there's food banks. There's you know, and and so so the ministry has really developed as each time God has organically opened a door or a possibility. So I, I had an opportunity to visit Red Lodge and to see that ministry firsthand. And what was remarkable was, um, you know, it, it meets in a sports pavilion yeah. that is a kind of community space. It's not in a church building at all, right? It's it's really yeah. out in where, which is the kind of the natural hub, it seems like, for that that neighborhood with lots of the young families moving in and sort of the football fields and, you know, lots of youth activity and sports being kind of a... Uh, already a sort of natural center for the community. Um, so so that was one of the interesting things about it. So that you talked about hospitality as being guests. This whole ministry, it seems like, is about being a guest in a neighborhood space. Oh, absolutely. And it was at the beginning, it was quite a heartache, actually, because when you're in somebody else's space, there are so many limitations as to what you can do. And um, you know, constantly having to set up and take down and set up and take down all their equipment for various things but it it has built you know being there has built relationships with um you know the, the leaders of the local community and it also means that um there's quite a lot of very basic level volunteering that's needed and that can be really helpful you know, um, to be able to accept people's offer to help, you know, put out tables and chairs can be really helpful. And there were there was one guy from there who who um who said to me he'd been to prison, and he said, uh, "When when you've you know come through the system as I have," he said, "People don't want to trust you. They want to help you, but there's nothing you can do for them." And he said, here, I'm, you know, I'm part of the family here. I can contribute. And it was giving him back his sort of self-worth and self-respect. Um, and he did. He, he wasn't a Christian at the time he shared that with me. Um, but he, he, did, he has now come through and come to faith and been baptized and is... Uh, is not living in that that particular area anymore, but is going on with the Lord in another church. So it's um but it was really um touching to me that the importance of allowing people to volunteer as part of their faith journey. And uh Di, the leader there, she she has she's full of great little phrases. Um so another one of hers is um you know you're part of the family when you're allowed to put out the bins. And uh, <laughs> I really love that. I love that too. And, you know, so one of the other things that, that was really interesting is I visited that community. I think we were there on a Friday night and there was some youth stuff going on is both the combination of, on the one hand, um, the first thing that people encounter is um, hospitality and love and listening around mm -hmm. some need. So whether it be food or opportunity just to connect for people who are lonely or you know, it's it's some need that people have. Yeah. But everything also has a very explicit Christian dimension to it. And, you know, I think often in the U.S., a lot of churches struggle with uh, they want to love their neighbors, you know, serve their neighbors, maybe through food or hospitality or just gathering. But um, sometimes they also then are not so clear about, OK, we, we want to connect this actually to Christian faith. But but there are some interesting ways that. Um, you all have developed and died particularly is experimented with around doing that. And, and one of the um, ways is around conversation spaces and gathering people in the context of, 
you know, of whether they're eating or whatever, um, to, to do some spiritual reflection. And I'm curious if you want to say a little more about what that looks like, because it's, it's explicitly spiritual, but it's also very inclusive and welcoming. Yeah, so they have a little thing called breakfast chat, um, which is, you know, they just serve breakfast and then there is a question on the table. And, you know, it could be something really simple like, uh, what are you looking forward to about Christmas? I mean, that that I can remember that being a really powerful one that came up for someone because somebody, you know, shared that actually they weren't looking forward to Christmas. And then, you know, a whole load of, things came out of that where you know where they were able to be um you know welcomed and given a community to share christmas with but um it's 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 those very open kinds of questions and feeling that everybody has got something to um be able to contribute in that situation and um they're not the only um group that we've we've had that does that as well that there's one a few villages away um, in a very tiny village where there hasn't been the new housing or anything. And they just met with um, 15 people and and they they would have cucumber sandwiches with the crust cut off, you know, and a nice little, you know, and tea with you and, and cake and, um, but rolled up very neatly on their China plates would be a little question that they could discuss together. And it was really interesting um, that it that after a while it was the people themselves who said, um, "Why, why do you um, never ask us a question about prayer?" So they'd ask very general questions um, that they'd taken from uh, the National Health Service. Our National Health Service has probably got some areas of spirituality and they'd use these areas of general spirituality to concoct these questions and um but then it it came you know from the example of the people that were there the the questions came out well why don't you tell us about prayer and about what you believe and and so then there was an opportunity to go a bit further um and I think a crucial principle across all of these little groups and initiatives is that it's not about the program. It's not about thinking, oh, here's a great idea that we can roll out and do everywhere. It's not, um, you know, it's not that we've got a food bank. It's not that we've got a kids discipleship group. Actually, it's, it's about each and every person. It's about recognizing that each and every person is on a discipleship journey and it's our job to accompany them and to treat them each one as infinitely precious and um i think it really helps us that we're in a rural area because we're not you know if you're in an urban area (laughs) you you can look and you can think oh if i put this on you know a hundred people will come um you can think about big demographics but if you're in a little village, um, actually what you're thinking about is the people that I know who would appreciate this or not appreciate this. It becomes very real. And and so often the discipleship journey is around, you know, what Jason or Tim or Claire, um, what they want to do, what they feel their next step is. And and often um we might offer something to them and then just say to other people would anybody else like to join in <laughs> and it's so it's not it's not that we're commending particular big programs but we're following what god is doing in the hearts and lives of people that of real people that are there in front of us <laughs> So I want to um, draw you out on a couple more stories. So um, so one of the places where people um, do gather or want to gather is just outdoors, right? It's a very beautiful yeah, sure. part of the country. And you have some experiments that are um, in com- communities that are sort of connected to outdoors, like a church on the beach, even 
year round, which when I was there, it was very, we, we did walk on the beach. It was extremely cold <laughs> and, and some, and uh, so kind of forest church kinds of things. And so share a bit about that. That's a place where people already, I think are looking for experiencing the sacred sometimes in our, in our culture. Yeah. Yeah. I do think there's something about a uh, church outside. And again, in, in our, in our situation, um, worshiping outside during a short period of COVID was what we were allowed to do. <laughs> You know, because you could like be distanced from one another, and so uh, a lot of stuff sprung up then. But um, yeah, so we've got one one particular group called uh, Spirit Light Wave, which is founded in a tiny village, and and they 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 basically do some kind of outdoor activity every every month, and it will be. Um, walking uh, Palm Sunday they decided to walk around um a lake with a donkey you know and and tell the Palm Sunday story and um it's interesting when you're walking with people how the conversation really flows um I I joined them um at, at Epiphany um there is a, a sort of continental tradition which I don't know whether you have as well but of um chalking uh the lintels of people's houses at epiphany you do have that as well yeah and so and um so the leader of this group had publicized in the village magazine that they were going to come and anybody who wanted their house blessed with an epiphany blessing could have their lintel chalked and they could have a blessing said over their house and um you know people just did volunteer and and then and then a group came um it was only about 15 people walking along and um, stopping praying a prayer of blessing um and then walking on to the next house but it was very much building community um and making a real difference to the people in those houses oh, i mean one particularly um somebody who'd been bereaved you could see it, it made a huge difference to have their house blessed at that time at that particular time um when the house wasn't as full as it used to be um and 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 it, it sort of you know it, it it models this evangelism being um being to do with hospitality as well because they were in a, in a strange way, they were both host and guest at the same time because each house was welcoming them, um, and and they were but they were bringing this blessing with them, um, and yeah. So so I think it, it, it's as we have another group that that goes on uh, walks and always ends up at the pub, and they've formed a real relationship with the pub where they you know have um questions and discussions in this particular pub over food on a regular basis and that group is in an area where there's a small amount of new housing um, but it's been great to have that sort of uh, pub and those walks to invite people to um, so yeah they'll take round that they they go and knock on the doors of people moving into the new estate and they'll take with them a spider plant just as a housewarming gift, a, a little card saying, you know, these are, this is what's going on in your local churches. But then they'll also invite them to, you know, a walk or a, a meet up down the pub, which is really great when you're moving into a new area because you just want to meet some friendly neighbours. <laughs> and so that's really worked well as well. Um, so even even the outdoor stuff is vastly different some of it's very child focused and some of it's actually quite adult focused we've got one lady who's uh, moved on to um, a small holding and uh, she's living in community and with with some quite people with some quite sort of deep needs and almost using the work on the small holding as as therapeutic um, and then once a month, she will um, lead something called um, Emmanuel Fire, which is where she will tell 
a Bible story or a spiritual reflective story. And um, it'll be around a fire, people have eaten food together. And it's that sort of after dinner, relaxed chat style that you you get, you know, I, if you if you sit out in the evening around a fire, you know, you, you get that vibe. And um it's really interesting. It's how people's hearts and minds open up in that kind of context. You know, it's it's a mixture of heartfelt sharing your experience but also you know these chats that you have as a university student that go on into the middle of the night that can be quite intense and it's like that you know it's you know people are bringing up these huge questions with each other and I think one of the things that really impressed me about that little expression was that people felt comfortable to come to it who were who were miles from wanting to be in a church miles and miles and um and yet they were having really deeply spiritual conversations about you know the existence of god whether forgiveness is possible um um you know what what's the direction of society um does community matter just just huge big spiritual questions um and helping each other with it you know quite a large proportion of people who've not got very much faith background at all but really open to uh using the bible as a tool to help them think about think about the big issues sally i love that and i'm i'm curious um i have a couple of things are kind of coming to mind as i'm hearing your stories and um, they're related to Jesus. Uh, <laughs> I can't help but thinking about how, you know, um, two things really, uh, how Jesus's invitation to the disciples, right, is is long before his question about who they who they say, who they think. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Um, and and um, thinking about the, the element of hospitality and being hosted and how, um, you know, Jesus's encouragement to, to seek the person of peace as the disciples are being sent. And I'm just curious, um, you know, theologically and, and biblically, uh, how if either of those dimensions of, of Jesus's own ministry and um, way of discipling the disciples <laughs> um, kind of plays into just the, the formation of fresh expressions. Yeah. They both, they both really, really mega influences really. So um, certainly we see discipleship as a journey. And so it's, yeah, there may be a point where people make a, a decision a bit like Peter saying you are the Christ um but but actually to seek that like straight off is not necessarily really listening to the person in front of you or walking with them you know so um and I think it it is it is having that heart that you want them to just discover Jesus and hold but always holding before them the manageable step the next the next thing that they feel that they might be ready to do or want to do to explore on their terms rather than yeah so that definitely relates in all sorts of ways um i mean another one of our our little groups is um cook at church which is a group for teenagers and um they basically every month that they meet they they cook some kind of meal so they're learning basic cookery skills but while it's off in the oven um they do some kind of um reflection and and often it will involve putting prayer requests into a big mixing you know cooking mixing bowl and then everybody taking out a different one and then praying for each other um but there are other things that they do as well around the seasons of the year um you know so if they're cooking easter biscuits they might tell the easter story um but but it's sort of meeting those young people where they are it's not insisting that they 
you know, have to make a decision right now. It's just giving them an opportunity to explore things that they actually themselves are finding interesting and they want to learn about. And it's not hiving it off from the rest of their life, you know, um, because they're, they're cooking and they're socializing they're doing they're doing all this stuff together not 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 in just some separate religious section so yeah that's quite important um and also we did talk about to our, our pioneers about seeking the person of peace um so you know that's the uh, the idea in the gospel is that um as you go out on mission somebody will say come and come and stay with me and and that when they when you get that kind of invite you go yes please <laughs> and you stick with them you don't you don't think oh um i better spread myself around you you recognize that god's at work in that person's heart and you and you stick with them and i think that that is um that 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 sort of relates quite closely to seeing the actual person rather than seeing the program or you know and I, I mean I think often in a village you will encounter somebody who wants to open a door for you I'm 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 actually I'm thinking of something from before from my previous ministry when I was a vicar and there was this one young woman who who wasn't a part of our church um. But we had a, a a group of mums who were new Christians and they would organise, um, you know, one of these events where you packed a shoebox for a child at Christmas. And this one mum, she'd gone to church youth group in her youth and she, she just loved this idea of giving away shoeboxes to these. And she would always buy loads of stuff herself. But not only that, she she would like she was our best absolute best um advert advertiser for packing these shoe boxes so instead of it just being a few mums in a in a lounge packing shoe boxes it just turned into this massive thing in the school hall with tables everywhere and the whole school bringing in their bringing in their you know mittens and soap and toothbrushes and toys and and all packing these things together and she was a, a real person of peace she did the same thing for our holiday club in the summer our gospel holiday club she did the same thing she wasn't yet fully sold on jesus herself but she saw so much good in it that she she wanted to open the door for others and she constantly did. <laughs> I love that, Sally. Um, okay, so who exactly leads these communities and how are they trained to do so? Okay, well, it is a real mixture, um, but mainly it's lay people. Um, and even some of our um, paid people have been lay to start with sometimes they become ordained along the way but you know um but mainly it's 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 the sort of person that you might think oh they could lead a home group you know that they, they would they would lead a bible study or that that kind of you know a committed someone who's really committed in their faith um but ha who has a real heart for those outside the church and is not too attached to doing things in one particular way because you have to be quite flexible around um what the people that you're reaching really want and to, to listen to them so yeah it's it's a whole variety of people we have a little scheme actually called rural outreach pioneers where if somebody is um doing some kind of outreach and it's successful as as a lay person they can apply um for um, money to work one day a week to increase their the time that they can give to that ministry and uh, well it, it's it's amazing how how people have done that and then ended up getting ordained or whatever <laughs> because for the opportunity just to exercise ministry so how do they learn the biggest way of learning the most important is to learn um 
by walking together with a group on mission with Jesus. That is the absolute biggest thing far above doing a course or anything it's about um not doing it on your own but doing it and most people who've learned to be a leader in this have possibly started by by being in a group where somebody else is leading and and they're sort of being apprenticed and i mean that's very Jesus model, isn't it? That's what he was doing with his disciples. And that that's what we're seeking to do, really. Um and some sometimes it can be a little bit, you know, you you, you develop a group and then you think, oh, it's we've just got it where we want it. And so it's, you know, I can I don't need to be quite so on it because I've got this brilliant other leader now. And then once they get to be a leader, they suddenly have a vision for what God wants them to do. <laughs> and then they're off doing that thing and you you have to build up another leader. So, um, but that's sort of the model. Um, and um, so at a diocesan level, what we're seeking to do is, is just to look out for, for people who need a bit of recognition and support to be able to build those groups. And then within the groups, more people will be nurtured to lead as well. Um, but we have other things that that help. So um, our leaders, we try to give them a, a coach, a one-to-one -one coach. And um, also we try to help them to meet up with peers. So um, in the UK, there's a lovely program called Myriad, which is about small scale church planting. And these pioneers, they all sort of meet together, not as individual pioneers, but their whole little team, their whole little group, um, come on this learning journey together. And it, it means that they are meeting other people who are working in a different context, but actually are facing those same challenges um, of, how do I listen to what God is saying in this community? Um, you know, how far, how far, how do I discern uh, whether I need to bend this to fit in with the culture or whether this is really a gospel value that I need to stick to? You know, those kinds of big questions that they're all encountering and sharing those together. Um, so, so peers are really important. And then I think also um, what I call sponsors are really important. So I guess it's somebody like me, somebody who who can um, defend you a little bit, you know, um, because often those who want to reach out in unusual ways, um, others can look at them and say, oh, that's not really church. Why are you wasting your time on that? You know, um, you know, surely if you're going to encourage people to walk by the beach on a Sunday, that's just going to stop them coming to our traditional communion service. <laughs> and and so having somebody who will stand alongside you who who can say, No, actually this is this is part of our calling. This is this is something that Jesus calls us to do as well. And it doesn't detract from the importance of that beautiful communion service. Um, but for some people, they're not going to go straight into that. Some people need to walk by the beach first. So Sally, this is so rich. And I just want to um, reflect back a couple of the really powerful themes I've heard from what you've, you've shared today. One is just the organic nature of a lot of these. They're very contextual. They're very much about listening and following God's lead in actual particular relationships with particular people in particular yeah. places. And so I think, you know, for those of us who have been shaped in the kind of these programmatic or standardized, we might even say it industrialized, you yeah. know, approaches to doing church or even church planting. I think it's really refreshing to hear this. Um, and you've also given a lot of permission. You know, it sounds like within that, that church system, people have um, the encouragement to actually follow how the spirit is leading on this and then the recognition of of their leadership at whatever level. And that's another thing I think that so many of our churches struggle and church systems struggle with is giving that that permission and sharing that imagination. So I think that's so powerful. Um, so for those of us, those of you who are listening or, or watching, who might have interest in 
exploring fresh expressions more. Maybe there's a leader in your church or maybe you yourself feel a nudge of the spirit to, to explore what it would mean to develop a fresh expression of church. Um, we have an on-demand course on faithlead.org that uh, walks you through the basic steps of starting a fresh expression of church. And so you can find the link to that course in today's show notes. Um, but Sally, thank you so much for the wisdom that you've shared and the amazing work that you're doing. Well, thank you for thank you for having me. It's really been, I mean, it's been great um, meeting you both and, and knowing that, you know, God is doing very similar things by his Holy Spirit in your part of the world as he is in ours. Sally, we have loved having you today. And listeners, thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you found this episode inspiring and encouraging. And we'd love to have you join us again next week as we take another dive into how the church can faithfully navigate a changing world. Alicia Granholm and Dwight Shiley signing off on another episode of The Pivot Podcast. We'll see you next week.